If you grew up in a committed Christian home, there are likely some rules that you intuitively know. There are Christian traditions that you assume everyone else understands. But that is not always the case, as this video will show us. Let's watch together. Oh, all right. Time to eat. Let's do it. Let's bring your buddy over for dinner. Thanks for having me, guy. Let's pray. Yeah. No, I was going to suggest that pray before we eat. Yeah, thank you. Take your hat off. You want me to take my hat off? For the prayer or just the meal? Or... Thank you. Okay, hats off. Okay, let's pray. We close our eyes. Oh, you want me to close my eyes too? Okay, bro, you told me about none of this, but all right, eyes closed, hat off. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I knew that. of these Christians. You know, depending on your background, what you view as holiness and what is right is different. If you grew up in a very traditional liturgical church, when you hear the word holy, you probably think of a priest wearing these ornamental robes. Maybe there's some beautiful stained glass windows, a big altar in front, a pipe organ that's humongous. If you grew up from a, in a fundamentalist background, holiness to you might mean things like not dancing, not playing cards, not going to movies, and a whole long list of things. If uh, you grew up in another tradition, maybe to you the word holy, you picture this preacher in a shiny suit, grease-backed hair, big Bible, sweating and yelling and thumping and stomping, saying, holy! Well, I don't know what your image of holy is, but this morning we're going to spend some time in 1 Peter to see what does God have to say about holiness and being holy. We read this in 1 Peter, verse 13. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. Now, it begins by saying, therefore, always in Scripture you ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Therefore always points backward to what has been said before. If you've been with us the past couple of weeks, where we've begun a series in 1 Peter, and Peter's been talking about this hope that we have. It's a repeated theme of this book, is the hope we have in Christ because of what he has done. So therefore points back to what Jesus has done. He also talks about our inheritance that's in heaven, that we can have hope, that because of Christ's grace and his love, we have this future waiting. So therefore, because of all these great things God has done for us, with minds, he says, that are alert. Now the King James Version renders this as gird up the loins of your mind. There's a reason the NIV translated that differently. It's because to Americans today, what in the world does that mean? But it's actually a very literal translation. The King James is not wrong. It's just people don't understand what it means. So I was trying to find something that would explain it to you, and I came across this illustration. Here's how you gird up your loins. So, first one on the far left says, The tunic wouldn't allow you to do heavy labor or fight in battle, necessitating the girding of one's loins. Second one says, first, hoist the tunic up so that all the fabric is above your knees. This will give you mobility. Gather all the extra material in front of you so that the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath and between your legs to your rear. This feels much like a diaper. <laughs> now, by the way, look at the top right. This is called the art of manliness. <laughs> so you're wearing a dress that you pull up and then make to feel like a diaper. Um, the fifth one says, gather half the material in each hand, bringing it back around to the front, and then finally tie your two handfuls of material together, and you're all set for both battle and some hard labor. Go forth, be ye men, and gird up your loins. Again, as manly as goes, that doesn't really appear manly, but, uh, but the reality is, in that time, you know, you're wearing this robe, a tunic, and... Uh, if maybe battle comes or there's someone, you know, attacks your family, whatever, you would not be able to run. So they would gird up their loins, literally. They would pull it up, tie it, so that they were ready. So the idea here of being alert is, 
That's what they were. You're ready for action. And we're to be ready for action. You know, we might say it is get ready. You know, roll up your sleeves. Pull yourself together. You know, athletes prepare. And they work hard. First of all, they would not wear clothing that would impede them. You know, they often wear outfits that are very embarrassing. I was a swimmer, and I remember when the coach told us that we were going to have to wear those little Speedos. And all of us were like, no way, I'm not wearing one of those. I mean, they're awful. But the thing with a regular swimsuit is when you do a flip turn, you come out of the turn, you have pockets, and pockets literally would just fill with water. They act like a drag suit. And once you put on a Speedo, you were like, wow. I mean, they're still humiliating, <laughs> but you just feel different. In them. So athletes do what they can to be at their best, to be alert, to be ready. And that's what we're called to do here, to be prepared for action. That God has things that he wants us to do. We need to be ready to do them at a moment's notice. You know, when I was in Scotland driving, I had to be very alert. I mentioned the roads were narrow. The highways were scary, narrower than roads we would have. And they had one-lane roads. And on top of that, you had to remember, drive on the other side of the road. Now, people said, like, that had to be the hardest part, right? No, not at all. Honestly, driving on the other side of the road was not difficult for me. When I got there, I just had a mindset, stay alert, focus, and there was never once that I turned onto the wrong side of the road Um, because I was really paying attention. I knew from our last time in Scotland when I had a head-on collision with someone coming around a tight curve, they were from Eastern Europe, forgot the British drive on the other side. So I was always very aware of that. But I came home, and uh, I slept terribly. The first night I went to bed at 10 p.m., 3 a.m. body time. 2.30 2.30 a.m., 7.30 a.m. body time, my body says, oh, time to get up. And I am wide awake looking at the clock going like, no, just don't. So I had a terrible night's sleep. I'm really tired the next day. Pull out of our driveway, no problem. You do that all the time, muscle memory, drive down. But I get back in the car a little bit later, and I turn out on this road, and all of a sudden I see cars in the distance coming in my lane. <laughs> and I realize I'm in the wrong lane. You know why? Because I wasn't alert. I wasn't focused. When I was there in Scotland, I mean, I really paid attention. And now I wasn't paying attention anymore. The reminder here Peter's giving us, be alert. You know, be ready. When I was over there, I was alert here. Just, you know, I know what I'm doing. No, I didn't. As Christians, we have to be ready for whatever God has. Be ready for what Satan throws at us. Peter says not only are we to be alert, we're also to be fully sober. The older version of the NIV used to translate this as be self-controlled. This is actually a more literal translation. The Greek here literally means to be sober. So the decision-making is impaired when you're drunk. And that's the idea here, that when you're drunk, you don't think clearly. You're slow-witted. You're slow to react. You're slow to respond. But we are to be alert. We are to be ready. Now, Peter is not only talking about sobriety from alcohol, but sobriety from anything in the world that would make you hazy or lazy. There's a lot of things that do that. It would be foolish to think that only alcohol or drugs would cause us to become confused or unattentive. You've probably heard the phrase, drunk with power. You know, there's a lot of different things we could insert in there. Some people are drunk with money, or their possessions. Or it's their career, or their reputation that's important to them. For some, it's their TV or their games or their video games. For some, it's sex. And it could even be our family, our friends. Anything that distracts us from what God is calling us to do, anything that keeps us from being the people we are to be, means that we're not fully sober. Well, Peter then continues in verse 13. He says this. He says, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So he says again, set your hope. Hope, a theme that you're going to keep hearing this over and over and over again. But in the midst of a people who were struggling and hurting, Peter wanted to remind them that there was hope, and we're reminded of the same thing. We're to set our hope. If you remember last week, we talked about the fact hope is not like, man, cross your fingers, boy, I'm just hoping this will work out. This is hope that is by faith you're trusting confidently in. He says, set your hope on the grace, the unmerited favor, the gift of what Christ has done, to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So we have a reason for this hope, because Christ will come for his children, and we will be with him. Well, because of all this, then, we're told as obedient children, 
Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. What child, what kind of child were you when you were growing up? Were you the good kid in your family? Raise your hand if you were like, you were the good kid. You were the mom, mom and dad. Come on. <laughs> I love Sabrina pulls Sophia's hand up in case you didn't know Sophia. Yes, that's you. So some of you, you are that kid. Now, how many of you were the bad kid? Come on, we know some of you. I love the stories. I always have three bad kids and one good kid. So <laughs> let me be. Sabrina held up Sophia's hand. Sophia makes bald jokes about me. Sabrina, on my in her birthday card said, "I don't look a day over 25." You're the good child, whether you know it or not. Well, the reality is. I was the bad child in my family. Matter of fact, my parents, when they were moving from Indiana to Arizona, they were going to be, uh, they were going to be living out of a huge, basically, bus size RV. They did that for about four years. They got rid of almost everything. They had us kids come to the house, and they really divvied up a lot of kind of the things that were meaningful to us. And so it would be kind of, well, who really wants this? And when it came to the Purdue paddle, my sisters agreed, Mark earned this, and he deserves it. This paddle and I were never friends. Amazingly, it's Purdue, and that was always my college team I rooted for, and I've always wondered how. Like, I should have some psychological issues with Purdue because of this. And the worst part is my parents kept this in the basement, and they would tell you, go get the paddle. So you got to walk, you know, and get the instrument. Now, I'll be honest, my parents didn't beat me horribly. I mean, it hurt. Matter of fact, mom didn't do it very hard, and I uh, got older, and uh, she'd been fake crying for years. And finally, I decided I'd had enough, and so I just turned around and I laughed in her face. And my sisters this day say, how stupid were you? Because mom said, it's okay, I will never paddle you again. From now on, we'll wait and let your father do it when he gets home. Not very bright. So I was the bad child, and I earned that paddle. But the reality is this. Compared to most families, I would have been the good child. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do drugs, I wasn't hanging out with bad kids. But I was certainly defiant, and I certainly had a bigger mouth on me than anyone else, than my sisters did. And so I was the bad child. But in your family, I might have been the good child. I certainly know in the Solorzanos, if Sophia's the best, I mean, I'm better than that. The reality is this, our Heavenly Father's standards are so much higher. Ken Gaines, my parents had high standards. My, his, his standards are perfection. It's holiness. And we all fall short of that glory. But we are called to be obedient children. What do obedient children do? They listen to their parents. They do what their parents say. They obey them. So he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. <clears throat> you know, before Christ, sure, there were all those things we did before we knew him. You know, often as Christians, we judge non-Christians. The reality is they don't have the spirit of Christ in them. Of course, that's how they're going to act. That's just what's in their nature. But we're not to be that way. He says, do not be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. I mean, the pole is still there. There's still those things we want to do, but we're not to do them because we want to be good children who are obedient to the Father that we love and the Father who loves us. Well, Peter then continues. He says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. You know, in principle, holiness is what all of us expect when we turn on the faucet, when we order a meal at a restaurant. We expect our water, our food, to be clean and healthy to use. This was the principle in view back in the 1860s when Russian scientists recommended moving the water supply for the pipes at St. Petersburg, the big city. Unfortunately, untreated sewage was flowing into the Neva River a few hundred yards upstream from the water intake. So upstream means the water's coming down, and then your drinking water was coming out of that. Well, in 1992, 130 years later, environmentalists visiting the city of 5 million people were shocked to find the situation had not been changed. Residents routinely continued to boil the brownish-yellow water that came from their taps. Many strained their water before drinking it, and unboiled the water contained toxic bacteria that would cause nausea and diarrhea. Holiness is like clean water. It's being set aside for use. At its most basic level, to be holy refers to a condition of something that is set apart, that is separated, it's different. 
It's a word its highest meaning refers to God and to objects and people that God has set apart for his uses. And so we're called to live holy lives just as God is holy. You see, God has the right to expect and demand holiness because that is who he is. This passage here is actually quoting, you see the quotes, Peter's quoting from the Old Testament. Passage in Leviticus that's more extended and says this, For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. It's clear in the Old Testament and the New Testament that God has called his people to live up to his standards. Because we serve a holy God. Now understand in the ancient world, gods were normally not holy. They were anything but holy. The ancient gods of the Phoenicians were cruel. They were lustful. The gods of the Canaanites were faithful liars. I mean the Greek gods. They were drunken, incestuous, vindictive, and murderous. So when they're taught that God is holy, this was different. See, we just take that for granted. Yeah, we know that's what God's like. But in this time... You know, the Roman gods, they were anything but holy. And so Peter's saying, no, no, be holy as, as our God, as he is holy. God could be dependent on always to do what is right, because that is his nature. He will always be truthful, because that is just who he is. But what does it really mean for us to be holy, where the word holy means to be set apart for a special purpose? You know, in the Bible, many inanimate objects are talked about as holy. Mount of Transfiguration, Zion. We read about holy oil. Prophets are called holy. Angels are said to be holy. Elders are called to be holy. We're all to be holy, but what does that mean? Well, in the temple, there was that back room known as the Holy of Holies. And this was that place where once a year, on the Day of Atonement, one person, the high priest, would enter the room. And when going in the room, he would fill it with smoke from the altar of incense, lest he become, come too close to God. Because when you get to God, close to God, something gets holy. This reminds me of that passage in Isaiah chapter 6, a very famous one, where Isaiah says this, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I mean, Isaiah is in awe. He sees God in His glory. So the train of His robe was so long it filled the temple. And these angelic beings of seraphim covering their eyes, covering their feet, they're flying. And they are saying, holy, holy, holy. And when they say that, everything shakes with God's glory. And the temple is filled with smoke. You know, sometimes God gives us a glimpse of that power, a glimpse of his holiness. When I was in Scotland, we had the, sec the period of days, two days, about 48 hours straight, it rained. Non-stop rain. In Scotland, it's kind of what you expect. And so it was about 8.30 at night, the sun had just come out. And uh, it stayed late later there, a light stayed up until about 10 o'clock or so. And uh, so I see the sun is out, and I couldn't see the sun itself, the mountain was behind us. But I could see that, yeah, it's clearly the clouds have parted. And so I said to Lauren, who was already in bed, I said, hey, Lauren, I'm going to go in the car, I want to see the sunset. He's like, ah, I'm going to sleep, so I jump in the car. I already knew from looking at maps beforehand that there was the mountain behind us, there was a road that went over it. And so I jumped in and drove and was just praying for a view of the sunset. And I come around the corner, and this beautiful view was there, and I stop, I take a picture, and then I hop back in the car, and I drive some more, and I pull over when I see this. And I take the picture. And I was just in awe of, look what God has done. Hopped back in the car just praying, Lord, even give me a better view than this. I really want to just be able to see it fully. Came around the corner, and I saw this view, and pulled over and got out of the car. and spent about an hour just in awe of what God had made. And what I noticed was the cloud, especially on the right-hand side. You see that cloud? It just hung over that one mountain. For about an hour, there was just always about that same height, just some clouds. It reminded me of this idea of the smoke, kind of hiding God's holiness. 
And as I stood there in awe, the sunset just got better and better and better. This was just taken, by the way, I haven't retouched these. This was the middle of the line uh, phone that I have, it's camera. And I just stood and just was amazed at the God we serve. Friends, he is holy. He is awesome. He's so far above anything we can imagine. That day he gave me a glimpse. I don't think I've ever seen anything more beautiful. A scene, I've been all over the country, our country, and I've seen so many things, but that was more than anything I've ever seen. And I felt in some ways small compared to God's majesty and his glory. It must have been how Isaiah felt that day he stood before God. Wouldn't it be great to be like Peter who got to meet Jesus? Because here's the thing, God reveals some of his glory in scenes like this. But in Christ, he fully revealed himself to humankind. And Peter got to spend time. Imagine just getting to say, like, Jesus, I have never understood this. You know? And just get to ask him those questions you have. When I was a kid, the question would have been, who were your mom and dad? Because everyone I knew had a mom and dad. I never could figure out as a kid, how was God not have a mom and dad? So you could ask Jesus that if you were a kid. As adults, those things you've wondered about, you could have asked him. Well, friends, Jesus has revealed God to us. But the more amazing thing is this. He said when he left, he would send the Holy Spirit of God who would come and live in us. And so the reality is, he said, it's better that I go. Because sometimes Peter got to ask Jesus questions, but normally Jesus was off doing other things. He was ministering to people, healing people, speaking. We have the Holy Spirit of Christ living in us. Do you know that today the holiest place in this world is in the body of each believer? This is our chapel. We kind of know it's not a church, so maybe you don't feel like this is really holy ground. But there are a lot of people who go to churches with gorgeous buildings, and to them, that building, that is a holy place. The reality is the New Testament doesn't talk about buildings as being holy places. The early church met in catacombs, literally places where bodies were kept. What is holy is God's people. And when we gather together, we make the home or the kind of gym slash chapel, or the gorgeous building and church, we make that place holy. You know, the Apostle Paul makes this point in 1 Corinthians. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why we no longer need a temple in Jerusalem that we go to. We no longer need a high priest once a year to go in and make this sacrifice because Christ has already made that sacrifice for us. And the Holy Spirit now resides in us. You know, I knew once of an associate pastor who told people that his office was holy ground. <laughs> and literally when they came in his office, they had to take their shoes off. Now, mind you, that it was okay for them to go in the sanctuary with their shoes on. I guess his office was a higher level. Thankfully, he was removed from ministry for that and other reasons like it. The rea reality is this. As Christians, we get so concerned about what we do around other Christians, especially if we're in church together. You know, gossiping, it's okay out there at church. You really shouldn't do it. You know, being mean to people, that's, you know, probably it's different. I hear it's, you know, you shouldn't. Sexual sin, yeah, out there, it's one thing a year, it's really bad. But the reality is, wherever we are, that is where the Holy Spirit is. And so we need to always remember that we bring God with us and we are called to be holy. Peter said, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. You know, so often we judge ourselves by the world standards, and we're doing pretty well. Again, you know, some of you in your family, you might have been the good kid. In my family, you might have been the bad kid. The world standards are not the standards we are to live by. We're to live by God's standards. The world didn't save you. The world didn't forgive you of your sins. The world did not offer you eternal home. Now, when I say we're called to be holy, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about a set of rules. I'm talking about an inner attitude that expresses itself in outward actions. 
That we allow the holiness of Christ living in us to come out. Not that we pretend to be good church people. God sees past the facade. He knows what's in the heart. And so since we are his children, we should want to be like him. Remember what it said? As obedient children. That's who we should want to be. As children who love their Heavenly Father. God's holiness should be our standard. It should express itself in all that we do. Peter says we're to be holy in everything we do. That means school, work, home, with your friends, with your family, when you're alone. It's a tough standard, but we're to be holy because the Spirit of Christ lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And God is the one who helps us. Because we can't cleanse ourselves. We cannot pull this off on our own. You know, my sons were babies. We would bathe them regularly. Now, you know, when they hit, like, 18 months old, I didn't hand a washcloth and go, like, you're old enough now, son. I'm going to be back in five minutes. You better scrub, and I better see your... I'm going to check behind your ear. They better be clean. Of course not. They couldn't take care of that. You know what I did want from them? It was just for them to work with me. You know, when I said, when I said lift your chin, I want to wash them, then they did lift their chin. You know, lift your arm. They'd lift the arm. Sometimes. They would work with me. But there'd be those other times they wouldn't feel like lifting their chin and they'd keep it down and I'd have to kind of get in there and it, it was a pain. And then there'd be those times, you know, kids don't tend to like to have water poured over their head so you get, you know, you get the shower head ready and, you know, they'd start to fight you on it. No, no. What I wanted was just for them to work with me. I knew they couldn't clean themselves. But I wanted them to allow me to do it and for them to do their part. Friends, that is what God is asking from us. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't live a holy life because you're too weak. You're like me. You're too prone to wander. But the Spirit of Christ lives in you. And He is the Holy Spirit of God. And He wants to make you holy. It's not about cleaning yourself up. It's about letting God clean you. And you, know, you might be able to fool other people by acting holy. God sees the truth. He knows what you're like inside. And that's why he wants you to be alert, you know, girding your loins for action, being ready to be fully sober so that you can think clearly. He wants you to understand that you're his child, so he wants you to be obedient. And then he wants you to submit yourself to him, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Allow the Spirit to have control of every part of you, to allow, allow him to make you holy as you surrender yourself to the power of the holy God that we serve. Let's pray. Father, forgive us because we fall short of your glory every day. Lord, our hearts are prone to wander. We are so easily distracted. We are so selfish and sinful. And Father, I ask today that you would help us to walk in the power of your Spirit as obedient children. Lord, we can't do this on our own. Many of us have tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. Lord, today, remind us that the Spirit of Christ now lives in us and you have all the power we could ever need to live the life you have called us to live. Spirit of Christ, transform us, we ask. Thank you for forgiving us when we fail and when we fall. Lord, thank you for loving us in spite of who we so often are. Thank you for an eternal home in heaven that we don't deserve but that you have offered to us. And thank you, Lord, that you are the one who can make us holy. And we ask you to do it through the power of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand.